We're seeing something globally we've never seen before, and it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, in 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good, Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's going to get the memo, they're going to cut rates, the pivot, and buy stocks. The bond market is saying no. This is bad, and it's going to get worse, and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. But what happens is, as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or or, or less. So, uh, so that's like a that's like a you know a big red siren, a flashing light, whatever you want to call it. Interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get close to recession, who who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, um, or even medium-sized businesses. Um, they see it. Uh, uh, you know, if you're in the trucking business, it's it's real time. Inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed. You're not moving anything by truck. A lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now, and the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business uh, heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, it's a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the terms. I don't want material adverse clause, clause, adverse change clauses kicking in. I said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits and the bankers go, "Uh huh. What's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards. They stop doing loss. And then interest rates will start to come down. But they, interest rates peak after the recession be, has already begun. So uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks. Bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. Um, and then uh, there's what I call the reality. What I see is is a kind of a hybrid the fed's doing what they're doing right or wrong okay they're they're doing what they're doing the market has their own interpretation i agree with the market certainly the bond market that the fed has probably over tightened they're going to keep going for the reasons i explained that means they're going to make it worse they're going to make the recession even worse and they may pivot uh to say that there could be a rate cut um, it won't be in April, but, you know, rate cut in August, maybe. I wouldn't rule that out, but for a really bad reason. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up, as usual, as they've been doing since 1913. They over-tightened. They didn't look at the forward indicators I described. And they found out too late, then they have to slam on the brakes, if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes, and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, p- p- attention spans seem to be short these days, but it was not long ago. Go back and look at look at a chart, uh, any stock index chart from October 1st, 2018 to, to December 24th, 2018. Um, less than three months. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow, so maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%, culminating in the Christmas Eve massacre, December 24th, 2018, when it dropped, I think NASDAQ dropped like 3% in one day. Now, here's the point. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre and after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, 
they don't care that much about the stock market level. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. And that's the key word. It's not if stocks are going down, but it's you know, kind of a little, you know, half a percent a day, one percent a day, trending down, lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30% in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008, I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly, but not just because they're going down. So there may be a pivot, you know, in late August, but, or, you know, July thereabouts, but not because of Goldilocks, but because it's not a soft landing, it's a crash landing. Um, so, you know, I don't match the company to the exact number, but layoffs on order of magnitude 10,000 to 20,000 terminated employees at Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, um, you know, and other, other tech names, uh, it affects other sectors as well, but tech in particular has engaged in a massive series of layoffs. Um, and so people go, well, wait a second, how come the, it hasn't shown up in the unemployment numbers? Because the, uh, the unemployment rate is, um, it's around 3.5, 3.6, I don't know the exact number. It's right in that neighborhood, 3.5, 3.6. We haven't seen that level of unemployment that low, that is since the 1960s. This isn't like oh, a good year or a good debt. You know, this is the lowest since the 1960s. And so, and the Fed is absolutely looking at that. You're right about that, Adam. And they're saying, uh, and of course, they believe in the Phillips curve, which is junk science. But the Phillips curve, for those who are not familiar, says there's an inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation. So if unemployment is high, inflation is low. And if unemployment comes down, inflation goes up. And so if you want to get inflation down, you should expect to bring unemployment up. That's what the Fed believes. What I just said is nonsense. It's not true. It's junk. But the Fed believes it. Uh, again, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the Fed thinks. They so say you got to put yourself in their minds to figure it out. So as far as they're concerned, that kind of those kind of unemployment numbers, lowest since the 1960s, that's inflationary. They got to get those numbers up. Now, here's what the Fed is uh, is missing, or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't, why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent. You'll turn down the lights, you know, you know, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes. Um, and then by the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like, oh, I've done everything I can. Now my business is in jeopardy. I have to fire some people. So that, and then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, et cetera. It's a lagging indicator. We know enough right now to know that number's going up this spring. But that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. Now, having said that, what else is the Fed missing? Well, wages are up 5% yeah. on an annualized basis, 5.2% on an annualized basis. I'm like, yeah, and inflation's 7% or 6%. So your real wage just went down one or two points. Because when, when, the, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports those wage numbers, those are nominal numbers. I'm not saying they're fake. But you have to know that they're nominal and you have to subtract inflation to find out what's happening to real wages. And the answer is real wages have been going down for a couple of years because um, they're, they're, it runs around 5% annualized, give or take. Sounds like any 5% raise, what, what do you want? Well, yeah, but with 8 9% inflation or even 6% inflation, um, your real wage is going down. So that's not a, a robust number at all. The Fed, by the way, the Fed wants to make, make it worse. The Fed agrees that uh, those wage gains are too high. But my point is, in real terms, they're actually going down, but the Fed wants them to go down more. That, that's, that would be one way to put it. If you get inflation down and, and wages are constant, then the real wage goes up relative to where it was before. Uh, but if you're unemployed, you have no wage. So that's that's another issue. Now, what the Fed is missing, and it's a long list, but uh, there's something called the labor force participation rate. Now, the labor force participation rate, you just take 
the number of people working divided by the total working age population. It's all, it's all you do. It's not sophisticated. Um, and that number today is around 61.2, uh, 61, give or take uh, percent. But as recently as um, 2000, that, that number was over 70 percent. Uh, and it has come down ever since. And it's, it dropped like a stone during uh, 2020, during the pandemic lockdown. Came back a little bit, but not much. The reason it got, first of all, it's never 100%. It shouldn't be. There are legitimate reasons to be working age population not working. You're, um, you're a homemaker. You're a, a student. Uh, you're an early retiree. Right. Uh, you're in the military. Yeah. You're in the, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of perfectly good reasons. So it's never 100%, not even close. But 70 is pretty high and 60 is pretty low. Uh, so, and the, the trend has been down. So that leaves, uh, relative to kind of a normalized number, that leaves about eight to 10 million people between the ages of 25 and 54 who are not in the workforce. There's a big untapped labor pool. But if you throw, if you took that group and threw it into the unemployment numbers, the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates it, unemployment would be about 9%. And that's the, that's the depression level of unemployment.